Pacific Story. This is the story of the Pacific, the drama of the millions of people who live around this greatest sea where the United States is now committed to a long-term policy of keeping the peace. This, as another public service of the National Broadcasting Company, is the background story of the events in the Pacific and their meaning to us and to the generations to come. Shanghai! What do you want to bet? I'll give you odds that in another couple of years, Shanghai will be back to normal. Matter of fact, things will be better. What's changed? Sure, some of the buildings were smeared, but they've all been patched up. The Langfu River is still where it was before. Su Chow Creek is in the same place. The Boond is still out on the waterfront. The race course is still in the middle of the city. The mansions and the Circle Sportif Francais are still out in Frenchtown. And the Shanghai Club here has still got the longest bar in the world. <laughs> so what's the odds? Just as I was telling them up in the Shanghai Club, it won't be any time at all, though, until Shanghai is running just like it was before the war. The war has changed many things, Mr. Whitfield. Oh, never changed Shanghai. <laughs> What'll you bet? You still bet on everything. That's my life. Yes, uh, that was Mr. Whitfield's life. Gambling. I had known him ever since 1925. And he had been in Shanghai sometime then. He never worked. He just gambled. And he was everywhere. Betting on the horses at the race course. Betting on the tennis matches. Betting on the polo games. Talking with politicians and dignitaries and sometimes with shady characters at the society clubs, escorting beautiful women to the country Columbia Club and to the little club, and always eating at the finest places. Ah, uh, Shanghai is going to be one of the show places of the world, though. Yes, Shanghai will be an important city. Will be? Oh, <laughs> it is. Why, it'll be back to normal in another couple of years, and one of the first things we got to do is to get those state lotteries going again. Remember them, Lowe? Yes. I remember them. Everybody was in on them. Yes. The poor as well as the rich. Yes. Sometimes I can't make these Chinese out. This guy Lo here, for instance. Smarter Chinese as you'd meet anywhere. Scholar, you'd call him. Been getting himself mixed up in the revolution ever since I knew him. Started it way back when he was a student right here in Shanghai. And what's it gotten him? A cracked skull, a couple of bullets through him. Some of these Chinese don't know when they're well off. Hey, you see, Lo, a lot of people will be coming to the Orient and now that the war's over, and a lot of them will be coming here. That's why we've got to get Shanghai back on its feet. You know, commercially. Yes. Uh, Shanghai serves more than half of China, and the more important half, economically. That's what I say, Lo. Shanghai's a big city. About the sixth city in size in the whole world. It should be a distinguished Chinese city. Well, yes, Chinese. <laughs> it is the main seaport of the whole Yangtze Valley. That is why it should be Chinese. You Chinese are always quibbling. Shanghai's a great city, a great outlet for you. What more do you want? Could you imagine New Orleans being controlled by foreigners, being an international city rather than an American city? Well, that's a different thing, though. It is different only in the sense that New Orleans is not the only outlet for all the wealth of your great Mississippi Valley. But Shanghai is, virtually, the only major seaport of the Yangtze Valley, and it is controlled by foreigners. But it was the foreigners, Lowe, who made Shanghai. The foreigners. 
The British came here during the Opium War in 1842. Captain, yes? British warships, sir. British warships are lying in the stream below us. What? They must have slipped in during the night. Come with me, sir. There. There they are, sir. With their guns pointing right at the fort. That big one, the steam vessel, must have come around the Cape of Good Hope. What shall we do, sir? Our duty is to defend Shanghai here at Wusong. Yes, sir. They are shooting at us, sir. The British warships blasted the Wusong fort and then landed a thousand men to march overland the 12 miles to Shanghai. By the time the ships move upstream to Shanghai, the city had been taken by the troops. Great sight for a city, this. Situated here at the confluence of the Wangpu River and the Suchow Creek. Yes. Here we can command the entire Yangtze. That will mean control of most of the Yangtze Valley. That is what we must have. On the Yangtze, our navy can float, and our power can be seen and, if necessary, felt. My people were frightened and bewildered. They watched the British move in. Yeah, you got to admit, Lo, that Shanghai never amounted to much before the foreigners came. It wasn't much more than a, a mudflat, was it? It was China's most important commercial city. Yeah, but look what it is today. It's got everything. Nightclubs, swell hotels, eating places, racetracks. And in no time at all, as soon as business gets back on its feet, it's going to be just like it was before the war. Better. Yes. The British came here in the beginning for our markets to sell their goods. They came as merchants and traders. And they saw to it that the Chinese did not interfere with them. The possibilities here are enormous. Here is a nation with a population nearly double that of all Europe. And half of it is at our fingertips, right here in Shanghai. Here the interior can be tapped. The tea gardens, the cotton lands, the silk centers. By way of the Yangtze, the millions of people of the Great Valley country can be reached with the products of Britain. Actually, Shanghai is the seaport of the Yangtze and the principal emporium of Eastern Asia. After the British, the Americans came. Then came the French and the other nationalities. And they barred the Chinese from their international settlement. They managed to keep the Chinese out for 10 years until the Taiping Rebellion. Look here, look here. We have nowhere else to go. But this is the international settlement. You are. The rebellion is sweeping through the land. Where else can we go? We will walk in. This is Chinese fur. Going up the road to the farm. Yes, yes, yes. Look here, look here, I say. Let us in, let us in. Walk in, walk in, walk in. The international settlement was no longer completely white, but more and more Westerners came as the years passed. Englishmen and Americans and Frenchmen and all the others. The Frenchmen built their own settlement. The French concession. And here in French town, the well to do foreigners built their homes. They made Shanghai a paradise for themselves, but they did little about the slums where the wretched people live in squalor and filth and die in disease and misery. You see, Lo, Shanghai is really a luxury center, the best of everything. A place where people come to do business and find a little mm, recreation. And now that the Japanese are moving out, things should be better than ever before. Oh, hmm. You see, that's what I mean. This guy, Lo, has still got those revolutionary ideas on his mind. Funny thing about these Chinese, it was his kind that were mixed up in that boxer rebellion back in 1900. Anti-foreign movements, as they call them. <laughs> his kind never changed. They were the ones that pulled off the revolution back in 1911. And no matter how tough the going is, they keep on fighting. Yeah, that's low here. Now, if he used his head, he could save himself a lot of trouble and make a nice thing for himself. Back in 1925, he was haranguing a crowd of Chinese students. 90% of the population of Shanghai is Chinese. And yet, what voice do we have in the administration of our own affairs? Yes, none. 
five of the members of the municipal council are Britishers, two are Japanese, and two are Americans. How many Chinese are there on the council? We are taxed by them. And most of the revenue used by the council to administer the affairs of Shanghai comes from us. Foreign warships lie in our harbor. Foreign police officers have been imported to control us. Foreign money strangle us. But now we have the courage at last to rise up against this injustice. Our Chinese workers, by the tens of thousands, have gone on strike. Even some of the Chinese financiers and generals have joined us. Our fellow students have demanded the end of unequal treaty and the end of exality. And they have been thrown into jail. Get them out of jail! I had just come in from the race course. The mob of young Chinese would row along with them, went to the Luzon police station. They demanded the release of the Chinese students. And somebody in that police station made a bad mistake. The crowd scattered, and there were about 20 Chinese on the pavement. Some of them were dead. Some of them were wounded. One of them was just standing there as if he was dazed. I went up to him. It was low. Blood was running out of his mouth, and a big bloody blotch was forming on his shirt on his side. Low, low, you're hit. Mr. Whitfield. He dropped to the pavement. The crowd went wild. All right, clear the way, clear the way. Stand back there. Get these people picked up. You, get away from that man. He's a friend of mine. Well, what's he doing here? I don't know. Must have just been passing this way. He, uh, he, he works for me. All right, you little bell. Pick up this man. No, no, no. I'll, I'll take care of him. Well, he's short. What are you going to do with him? I'll take him out to my place. Well, you better hurry. He's not going to last long. Keep those people back over there. It was touch and go with Lowe for weeks. Even my doctor didn't know if he was going to make it. But finally, I I knew he was getting better by the way he talked. Yes, uh, Mr. Whitfield. Some of us were killed Some. and... A dozen at least. And what did it get you? We did not lose. We have called the attention of the whole world to the wrongs of Shanghai. Listen, Lo, listen. If you would have kept your mouth closed and minded your own business, you wouldn't have got shot. And neither would any of the rest. Sometimes one can do more by getting shot than by not getting shot. Sometimes I think you're crazy, Lo. We will make Shanghai a Chinese city. Oh, Lo, don't be a sucker. What are you going to get out of it? A couple more bullets or a pauper's grave? The Taipans know their days are numbered. I could have laid you a bet and given you odds that the Taipans wouldn't budge. It's out of the question. The Japanese of Chinese rather objected because they said they didn't have any members on the council. So we admitted three Chinese. But they still weren't satisfied. So we admitted two more. But were they satisfied? No. Now they're asking for more concessions. But gentlemen, I say the making of concessions to the Chinese is at an end. To make any further concessions would be to give up the settlement and to do away with extrality. And that is out of the question. But Lo could never see it that way. The writing is already on the wall for the Taipan. The British control the gas and the waterworks, and most of the transportation. The Americans control the electricity, the power, and the communications. And the opium? Well, you know, Mr. Whitfield, who controls that. But in the last few years, new industries have created a whole new working class in Shanghai. And these workers someday will join with us against the Taipans. That's the way he talks. I took care of him until he was well. I offered to use him in my, uh, business. Smart boy, pleasant personality. Plenty of room for guys like him in my business in Shanghai. Ah, but he couldn't see it. And I guess maybe he didn't have the knack for it anyway. He doesn't look much different today than he did then. You know, Lo, a lot of water's gone under the bridge in these last few years. And it's time that you start thinking of taking care of yourself. Yes, Mr. Whitfield. A lot of water has gone under the bridge. Mr. Whitfield has hardly changed. He has always managed to live well. I wonder where he could have been during these years. He's a little grayer and a little punchier, 
But he is dressed as well as he used to be when he was in the silk trade and in the opium trade. He looks almost the same as he did at the time of the Shanghai War in 1932. Something ought to be done about this Chinese boycott of Japanese goods. They're antagonizing the Japanese. That's what I say. First thing we know, they're going to involve Shanghai in the squabble over Manchuria. Of course, and that's none of our business. Shanghai is neutral. And it hasn't helped any to have Chiang Kai-shek send that Cantonese 19th route army up here. Gives the Japanese the idea that we want to fight. What we've got to do is to get to the Chinese that are heading up this boycott against the Japanese. Yeah, they're the ones. They keep yelling about the Japanese moving in on Manchuria. Why, Manchuria's hardly been a part of China for years. It's practically independent. They won't listen to reason. They can see what we've made of Shanghai, the most modern, the most cosmopolitan city in the Orient. And yet they can't see that if they keep harping away at the Japanese, that we're going to have trouble here. Oh, I've talked to one of these Chinese until I'm blue in the face. A fellow named Lo. Yeah, that guy Lo. One day he called me an old China hand. You know, he meant that I've been out here in Shanghai for 35 years without learning Chinese. And I said to him, why should I learn Chinese? Shanghai isn't Chinese. That's what they don't understand, and that's what makes this boycott business so dangerous. They've still got the idea that Shanghai is... Mr. Whitfield and many of the other foreigners objected when the Japanese started using the international settlement as their military base. But they said very little about the Japanese bombarding the Chinese section. You see, Lo, that's what comes when you antagonize people. You overlook, Mr. Whitfield, that the Japanese have literally stolen Manchuria. We have no weapons to fight them. Suddenly, we have the right to boycott them. What good has it done you? Look. Look up there. If you Chinese don't come to your senses, those Japanese planes up there will be dropping bombs on you. We cannot give in. Low, low. When are you going to start using your head? Now, most of the foreigners of influence felt as Mr. Whitfield did. It's an invasion by the 19th Root Army. That's what it is. Exactly. We ought to be thankful for the presence of Japanese troops. Now, the only protection we have against looting, and heaven knows what else by the 19th Army. What are these Chinese thinking of? They want to make a battleground of Shanghai? I say what's happened in Manchuria between the Japanese and the Chinese is no concern of Shanghai's. The Chinese don't seem to realize that. The Chinese 19th Root Army stood firm. <laughs> cannot hold out against the Japanese low. They are stronger in numbers and equipment than we are, and we are isolated. They are blasting the Chinese sections unmercifully. Can we get no help from the foreigners? No. The 19th Army resisted with all its strength, but at last it crumbled. And the Japanese spread their influence. Any schoolboy could have seen this coming, Lo. Why didn't the foreign forces join us against the Japanese? The fighting took place in the Japanese defense sector, didn't it? Besides, this isn't our war. Uh, some of the foreigners were more charitable in public. But privately, they expressed other opinions. It was unfortunate and perhaps brutal. But let us hope that it has taught the Chinese a lesson. <laughs> over now, and people want to forget about it. Pretty soon now, tourists are going to be able to buy everything here in Shanghai that they bought before the war. Silk rugs, jewel jade, things like that, and a lot of other things. Yeah, they'll be coming right into this waterfront here, just as they used to do. And there'll be plenty call for a man of your intelligence and your personality. You know Shanghai. And even if you're not interested in my line of business, you can do pretty well for yourself. I'm not thinking of myself, Mr. Whitfield. Uh, you, you think that by this time he'd get wise to himself after all he's been through. At last, we will stand up to the enemy. I remember him saying that back in 1937, after that incident at the Marco Polo Bridge. 
Chiang Kai-shek means every word he has said. About ordering the Japanese out of Peking? Yes. They will have to clear out of Peking and Tintin, or we will fight them. With what? <laughs> Look, Lo, this sort of thing, all these, these squabbles and local wars have been going on out here in China for centuries. We can't stop them. I can't and you can't. The thing for you and I to do is to stick to our knitting. We will fight. Now, look. Look, Lo, don't you and all the rest of you go kicking up a disturbance here in Shanghai. Let's keep Shanghai out of it. The time has come for us to make a stand. Well, a bunch of us were sitting around in a bar at the Cafe Hotel, talking. In spite of everything we've done, the fighting may break out here any minute. Naturally, with the Huang Fu full of Japanese warships. Well, that isn't the worst of it. It's those Japanese transports loaded to the gunners with fighting men that are heading here. They probably would not have come if that Chinese sentry hadn't shot that Japanese offside near the Hongjiao airfield. What was he doing out there? Well, what are the Chinese troops doing concentrating out there in the demilitarized section in the suburbs? Well, naturally, a Chinese sentry is going to challenge a Japanese officer prowling around an airport. The whole thing was stupid. Do you hear that? What? Sounds like bombers. Yes, that's what it is. Come along, let's go out to the street. We hardly got outside before the bombs began to fall. Those are Chinese bombers. They're Chinese bombers. Lost it, fool. The bombs came crashing down at the main intersection of the settlement, where Nanking Road meets the Bund. Right in the middle of all the people. One of them landed in front of the cafe hotel where we just come from. We scattered as fast as we could. Mr. Whitfield! Mr. Whitfield! It was low. Mr. Whitfield, you better get out into the suburbs, out to where the Chinese troops are. What's the matter with those pilots of yours? Have they gone insane? They are bombing the Japanese warships in the Wampu and the Japanese positions and industry. Well, they're hitting Nanking Road and the Bund. They are also hitting the Japanese. You better go out behind our lines, Mr. Whitfield. I'll stay here. Shanghai is being evacuated. The next day, the scramble started to get out of Shanghai. Thousands of Americans, Britishers, Frenchmen, Dutchmen crowded aboard the liner. Goodbye to you, Whitfield. I'll, uh, I'll see you here when it's blown over. It will not blow over. If the Japanese should win, they'd take over Shanghai. And if the Chinese should win, they would never permit us to come back. I'll see you in the Shanghai club when it's over. Goodbye, sir. Cheerio, Whitfield. The Japanese troop ships landed their men. The Japanese warships pulled up in the stream to shell the city. The Chinese brought up reinforcements. And planes from both sides loaded up with bombs. Then it came. Well, it went on like that for three months. Then Shanghai fell, and the Japanese took over. I wondered what happened to Lo. <laughs> wanted to ask you, where did you go when the Japanese took over in 1937? I stayed with the Chinese troops until I saw you here again in 1940. You came back even though you knew if they recognized you, they would have bumped you off? Hey, where did you get that scar across your forehead? Okay, okay Lo, you did your part for China. You had to do that to get smart. And you picked a great spot to come back to. Now the thing to do is to make the most of it, Lowe. Uh, I'll be glad to use my influence to help you get back on your feet. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Shanghai was not as free and easy after the Japanese took the city. But when I came back in 1940... Mr. Whitfield seemed to be prospering about as well as before the Japanese came. Many refugees came to Shanghai. He made friends of them. Yes. Yes, that can be fixed, Fritz. Uh, suppose we have lunch at the Parisienne. Hmm? If you do not mind, could it be anywhere but 
the Parisiens. Oh. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. How about the uh, Astor Grill? Hmm? Uh, that would be much more satisfactory. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whitfield is a practical man. In 1940, the Germans were winning in Europe, and the Germans and the Japanese were drawing closer together. The Japanese had taken over French town, and they had won control of the municipal council. Gradually, Mr. Whitfield was able to see the merits of the Japanese point of view. But he was too practical to lose sight of the Western point of view. America was not yet in the war. I don't know what to make of this, Whitfield. The United States is not actually thinking about giving up its rights in Shanghai, is it? Not only the United States, Britain, too. Here it is. They say that uh, after the war, they will be willing to negotiate for the relinquishment of extraterritoriality and other so-called special rights. What can they be thinking about? That's what I say. All we want for our investment is reasonable security. That's the least we can ask. Well, that's right. We're not interested in throttling China. Do you think we are, low? China will not be interested in just a promise of willingness to negotiate extrality when the war is over. China wants a promise that the Western nations will give up extrality. Lo, you're being unreasonable. China's day was coming. In 1940, the British and American citizens were streaming out of Shanghai. Well, these are the last British troops. All British military forces have now been withdrawn from Shanghai and North China. We're moving our surplus stocks of oil from Shanghai to Singapore. They were leaving Shanghai like rats leaving a sinking ship. By February 1941, most of the last 2,500 American civilians were evacuated. In 1942, the U.S. gave up its extraterritorial rights. We knew the showdown was coming between the United States and Japan. You, uh, you heard anything about the 750 U.S. Marines that are still here moving out low? Only the same rumors as you. Mm-hmm. I think the time has come for me to leave. <laughs> Mr. Whitfield left in September. On Pearl Harbor Day, the Japanese took over all of Shanghai. The white man had been chased out of Asia. Well, <laughs> it's been a long way to get back here to Shanghai, Lo. Four years. But we're back here again, and that's what counts. Uh, Lo, what are your plans now that peace has come and the Japanese have been thrown out, huh? I will uh, continue to work for the same thing I have worked for all my life. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, <laughs> stay out of trouble. Well, there is still uh, much to do. i uh, lay your bet Shanghai will be back to normal or better in another couple of years. Oh, well, perhaps. Well... Take care of yourself, Lo. And say, if you ever need any help, come and see me. Listening to the Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations, as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. May I repeat? For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, Send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California.
Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Sidney Miller played Whitfield. Peter Chong played Lowe. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>